So morning, everyone. This is Simon from Yoga Loft. And this morning we have Lara Stapleton, one of our yoga teachers. Morning, Lara. Hello. Hi, Simon. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. And it's lovely to see you today. Good. Nice to be here. Thanks for joining us. Um, why don't we kick it off by just asking you, tell, tell us a little bit about what you're working on in your yoga at the moment and maybe a little bit about um, the, the style and the way that you teach. Um, well, I'm a Scaravelli inspired yoga teacher and I've been on a very deep uh, inner journey for about 20 years uh, with um, the way I practice. And um, I suppose really the kind of the essence of, of my teaching and practice is about working with the subtle body and, um, and primal movement. And I think, you know, I believe like in the West, you know, uh, we've kind of superimposed a lot onto ourselves, even in the terms of, in the in the way you know we move uh, with our body in in mm -hmm. certain yoga practices, and um, you know we're kind of going. It's like peeling back the layers of the onion. You know, it's like peeling back all these layers to kind of reveal what's actually really there at our deep, you know, inner essence and, and truth. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting. I was supposed the the journey of my my my. I mean, I've been practicing yoga for over 20 years and I first uh, did yoga in India in in Vakala and um, I found this wonderful teacher over there and I was hooked in my first uh, Shavasana and um, and and then you know and then Hatha was my kind of main you know practice and I definitely would say in my 20s I was all about the physical form of the pose and you know and and the asana and I would definitely I would say pushed myself probably to some extremes that my body just didn't want to go to or wasn't ready for. And in that, uh, I actually injured my back. And um, that injury was probably the, the greatest blessing I had for the work that I now do, because that's really my niche is working with the back and the spine and injuries and having healed myself um, through working more internally and with the breath and having a more meditative um, focus, you know, on the practice and just, you know, working with subtleties in the body and working with sensation um, as, it, as it arises. And sometimes less is more. So, I mean, I always work from the ground up. Um, a, a, the first part of the practice is very much like on the ground, really feeling into all our little grooves and our cracks and, you know, just really, sensing how the body moves, uh, why it moves in the way that it does, um, and, and feeling into what's arising in that moment, you know, noticing whether you've got fatigue in your body, you know, as a, as a culture, a lot of us have speed trapped in the body. And so it's not until we kind of arrive on the mat and working close to the ground like that, when you work with your spine out of gravity and you're close to the ground, you've got that support coming from the earth. And there you're not putting undue force into your structures, into the musculature. So then you can start to work with some of the superficial layers, you know, the, the skin, the fascia. Um, so it's really nice, you know, it feels really intelligent for me to work with opening up all the myofascial uh, tissues through the body on the floor before you then integrate um, asana and, and standing poses and inversions and whatever you want to, to bring in next. Okay, that's a that's a pretty deep answer. Um, I, I was struck by a couple of things you said. Um, you said subtle body and primal, and you also said uh, what I liked what you were just saying about well, what you were saying about removing. It sounded like you were removing. Um, I was going to say gravity, but I suppose by going to the floor, I suppose when we stand, so much of our weight is is on the spine and is on the joints. So it is what you're saying when you say going to the floor is taking a large amount of the weight off the off the skeletal structure, mm -hmm. or, or should we say dispersing it through a, a wider area. And then because obviously when we lie down, that's a great relief often because all the weight comes off yeah. the body. So there is that sense of relief <laughs> when you're when you're working out of gravity. There's that sense of, you know, because you're fully in contact with the earth, you're not putting that undue force into into the skeletal structure into the musculature so then you can you can work a little bit more from that sensory realm 
And, um, and I think when you start to work from the sensory realm, you start to tune into more, you know, what's going on subtly into the body, which sometimes kind of gets overlooked or not connected to in when you're when you're when you're standing i mean of course you know you've got i work very therapeutically as well so you can do incredible you know standing poses where you've got the support of chairs bolsters and um and then it's sort of like a kind of a yin yang you know experience where you're kind of working quite actively and bringing a little bit more sympathetic charge kind of into the feet and the legs but then the upper realm is a bit more passive it's a bit more um in the in the parasympathetic and um so yeah so 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 working working from the i mean you know working from the ground up i mean are you sorry are you saying that it sounds are you saying that you would you could you might start a practice in shavasan with a kind of meditative aspect or are you talking about um, I will always start, no, I will always start in Shavasana. Right. So I will always start with an initial Shavasana. And that's really an opportunity for, for the student or, you know, in my own practice to kind of empty out before you begin the practice. So it's, you know, just sensing what's rising in your body. How is your breath today? You know, is it flustered? Is it dormant? Is it restless? So you're just kind of tuning into your own kind of sensory experience of where you are. You know, you could be really exhausted. You know, you could have like, you know, what are your fatigue levels like? What's your digestion like? So it's kind of taking like a broad scan uh, through the body. And I think that's a nice way, you know, it can just be a few minutes. It's not like, you know, 10 minutes of asana at the end. And then, you know, unwinding, just starting to go into movements which are all done on the floor, but you're, they're rotational, they're sliding, gliding. This is the primal spiral, aspect now. Spiral, yeah, there's a spiralic aspect. And that's a really nice way to open up the myofascia in the body and really to get the flow of blood and plasma and lymph, you know, pulsating through the tissues, uh, through the cells. So that kind of prepares, it's like a preparation to then when you come into standing, you've kind of opened up quite a lot um to then yeah to go into your more maybe kind of um i kind of careful of how i choose language because i don't really like to push or force or use vigorous but just something that's a bit more active and i from my personal experience i really like to integrate always some standing with with what i do on the floor because if you just do that floor work it's so kind of you can kind of go off into a trance you know it can go so deep that you can almost just kind of float off into the ether. And actually, I like my students and for myself as well to be really grounded after the practice. So then when you incorporate, you know, the standing poses and actually the Scaravelli practice is very much working up from the ground, through the feet, up into the legs, up into the pelvis. You're kind of gathering that energy up and, and the feet are like everything. I mean, everything is about the feet. It's the absolute, you know, root. It's the foundation of the temple of our body. And, you know, Vanda was, Vanda Scaravelli was, you know, she was Iyengar's muse. I mean, she studied with Iyengar. And there's a lot of Iyengar that's interwoven into, into the Scaravelli practice. I mean, I love Iyengar as a practice. It's, it's you know, it's phenomenal. Um, my teacher in America is an Iyengar teacher. So, um, so a lot of that is woven in. So I, I think there's a real intelligence in that of kind of, you know, working from the ground up. But then you get that sense of lightness, you know, through the spine. So the more you give to gravity through your roots, you know, through the lower realm, through the feet, the legs, the, around the pelvis, then you're, you're inviting that extension, you're inviting that space and that elongation into the spine, which feels very freeing and uh, it's very heart opening. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it feels very kind of organic. That's fascinating. And one of the things that you, I think you've mentioned to me in the past um, when we've been communicating is, is dealing with past traumatic experiences through the somatic experience. Do you yeah. wanna say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I think, you know, I mean, tra when, when someone goes through trauma, you know, that is so, you know, embedded in their cellular structure, in their tissues. And interestingly, you know, sometimes when people go through trauma, they also kind of suppress it. They kind of like, 
they go, oh, I can't, I don't want to like deal often, with it. No? Often, no, often. Often, you know, I mean, it's, you know, we all know we suppress feeling, we suppress emotion. And then you ask, you invite someone to sort of connect into their breath and consciously breathe. And then it just brings up a whole host of, you know, feeling, emotion, trauma. And then it's just kind of, they want to kind of, you know, bury it down again. So I think the beauty of working somatically with trauma and, you know, a lot of the work that I do on the ground is it's quite a kind of safe space for people to just slowly start to kind of go into some of that because, you know, you don't want to take someone who's gone through trauma and it could be trauma from childhood. It could, you know, even past life. You know, we, we carry the DNA of our of our ancestors, you know, as deeply in our own DNA. So we never know quite where it's arisen from. Um, and so I think it's, you know, going in slowly, gently. I mean, I as a teacher, I like to create a very safe and nurturing space, which gives people that space you know so they've got that space to to maybe explore some of it but feeling like held and and supported i mean that that transpires a little bit more deeply when i teach retreat because on retreat which obviously i'm passionate about and we can't do so much so of right now sadly um but you know you go on a deeply transformational journey with your students i mean you know i do really long deep sessions we'll do three hours in the morning two hours in the evening and you know, and it's and it's there's a huge shift that happens, and then you're working with the same group of people for for the whole week. So that's you know that's a really beautiful experience. But I think I think somatically is a really good in way to go with someone who has you know experienced trauma. And actually, when I work somatically on the ground, you know, very small things like. Um, you know, we often start on our back, but I also bring people onto their side and into prone. And the advantage of bringing someone into prone uh, who's had gone through trauma is when they're in the belly down, they feel a little bit more protected. They feel a bit more safe. Sometimes actually someone being on their back who's been in trauma can feel really exposed. They can feel really vulnerable and that's not a safe space for them. So you have to go, okay, so how can I kind of change it around to to accommodate you know if someone's been sexually abused you know having them on their back like that could be really triggering right. um and then other things you can do of like you can do a practice where you're doing movements where your feet are against a wall so you've got so you're laying on so you do the laying down practice but rather than having your feet just kind of you know off into space mm -hmm. you actually bring their feet against the wall so they've got something to press into and feel into and then that again is gives them that kind of protection it gives them that kind of security it gives them that kind of okay this is a feels like a safe space to to explore but you know it's 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 tr you know it's trying lots of different things but most importantly creating a safe space for them to to to, to go into some of the trauma and I suppose um, being on the floor in a way um, allows a person to move towards the fetal position or be, be, be kind of connected to it. So, which gives them a feeling of security. Yeah. Um, and also what I was thinking about was when you mentioned the breath, obviously so much of our emotion gets trapped in the diaphragm mm. and the diaphragm, I mean, if you explore most people's breathing patterns they're well within kind of like a you know a narrow area of the diaphragm's potential mm. and um so often when we ask people to breathe deeply they just don't want to do it unconsciously yeah so i think that diaphragm which is a lot you know we, we we spend so much time having backache and having a sore back and a sore lumbar area where which is obviously <clears throat> connected to tension but when you look inside the body at the diaphragm which really traps so much tension because of the connection to the breath. When you start to release that through being in a prone or a relaxed position and allowing the person and guiding them mm. to release the diaphragm suddenly so much is. No, this is, and this is really, really true. And, and if you think about it, if you think about, you know, someone who's come to the mat and 
they've got years and years of stress and anxiety that's kind of like embedded in the body. And you know, where's that sitting? It's sitting in between the ribs and the diaphragm. And then you ask someone to consciously breathe and that that space has already accumulated with like, you know, tension that's been there for years and years and years. So it's a real process, you know, it's a real journey to slightly kind of go in there and gently start. To, and actually I found, you know, you know, <laughs> breathing is a little bit like being on the crest of a wave, you know, it's like that simultaneous feeling of delight and resistance all at the same time. So some people have, you know, they might have a reluctance to really meet their breath or have a resistance in meeting their breath because, you know, it's uncomfortable. You know, they've got that tension that's already there and they've got that emotion that they've suppressed and they don't quite want to kind of go, go, go into that space. And it can bring up other emotion. You know, you can ask someone to start consciously breathing and you're guiding them through breath. And they can start to feel quite frustrated, quite angry, you know, because it's all that tension has been there for such a long time. And then you're kind of inviting them to, to you know, really breathe. And they're either a shallow breather or they're holding their breath most right. of the time. And, you know, I find most students are either have, you have a shallow breath or they're holding their breath. They go, oh, my God, I'm holding my breath. I'm holding my breath. I've just realized I'm holding my breath. <laughs> And people, people, I, I'm always fascinated by how people struggle to let go of tension. They struggle. If you say to someone, "Here, yeah, let me lift up your arm and then you lift up their arm and then you take your hand away, their arm stays there. Mm. And then you say, no, I, I've said, release your arm. And they, and, and if you think that that's what, and you realize that people are, we're, we are walking around with so much held tension. Yeah. You know, why carry around the excess body parts that you don't need to be carrying at that particular moment? Why, you know, and if you translate that internally, it's why why are you why are you choosing to not breathe unconsciously? Let's let's learn to let go of excess and it's a, it's yeah. A and the you know the breath is really the essence, and I think it's really important to kind of come back to that. So before you start bringing in lots of different movements and postures and asana, you know, just come back to the breath. I mean, one of the teachers that I love, Angela Farmer, and um, she's in her 80s, and she's a beautiful practitioner. And she talks about, you know, the breath is the most intimate lover that you'll ever have, you know, it comes in at birth, at least when we die, yet we kind of allow it to kind of, you know, do its thing, but we don't really kind of take too much kind of, you know, notice until, you know, obviously the body starts to break down. And, you know, we become like this tired horse because we've been pushing and pushing and pushing our body until it just literally breaks down, you know, and then we're, we've got to go, okay, you know, we get that wake up call or someone's got to go and have back surgery or some, some something like that. So I think it's, you know, this is the essence and really whatever evolves from that, whatever evolves from just you breathing is really a miracle. You know, it's, it's a gift, like any movement that kind of unfolds. And I think that's, for me, that's the importance and the intelligence of working with the body is allowing your body to unfold, to unravel, to unfurl itself, but from the breath. And then and then just see where the body naturally and organically, you know, wants to go to without forcing, without pushing, because then you move into the doing realm, you know, and I think being movement, you know, really allowing the movement to be as it needs to be rather and we're as a culture as a society as you know we, we are doers you know we all know that you know we've got our to-do lists you know it's like emails text messages meeting with so and so but you know we are naturally doers and so and we can bring that to the mat you know we bring we bring that doing to the mat so i always invite people to just really you know just you know think about it just have that curiosity okay am i doing this movement or can i allow my kind of felt sense to come into and you know and a lot of people they they don't really know how to feel you know it's, you've got to like kind of get them out of these kind of stuck habits and re-educate and um and and show them you know invite something else to come in you know to start feeling just start with your breath how's your inhale today how's your exhale maybe you struggle to breathe in maybe your exhale's really really short because you're scared of letting go you're scared of letting go of that fear that you've been holding on to for 20 years. Um, so yeah, coming back to the breath. So once you've, once you, once your students have been invited to tune in and to experience where they're at, 
what is your process towards guiding them kind of away from their 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 away from themselves not from themselves they're obviously you connecting them to themselves but to guiding them to guiding them what's your process for guiding them well i think it's um i think what's kind of quite important is to not like overly instruct sometimes and i think that's you know i think you don't want to like give give them too much because it's like it's a, it's like a process as well so i think you've got to even be careful like certainly with a lot of the floor work i don't instruct the breath okay so i like to allow this sense of spontaneity to arise yeah because you know Joe blogs down there on that mat over there and Suzanne over there on that mat, you know, they've got different breaths, you know, you can't say, okay, inhale now and exit, you know, so, and especially with, you know, a lot of the floor work where it is very sensory and you're feeling into your own structures and it's like, okay, what is my signature shape? You know, we all have a signature shape. So when you arrive in Shavasana, you know, is one foot slightly more turned out than the other? How is your right hip feeling? Have you got a scoliotic curve? You know, like there's all these things that present themselves. So it's a, like meeting your body on the mat. And then, you know, how is your breath? And so as you move through, it's, I, it's kind of like a layer cake. So that's the way I kind of teach. So, you know, I will guide people into the movement. But once they're in the movement, then then it's for them to start going at their own pace and start to journey with that movement and start to feel that movement. And then I'll bring in some of the sensory language. So, you know, sensing into your whole lateral sheath, you know, how much space have you got in your ribs? You know, is your fascia feeling, you know, gluey, sticky, you know, and we've all got asymmetry, you know, so how does one side feel compared to the other? So you kind of invite that sensory language, but also that sense of inquiry as well. So they can start to think about, oh, actually this hip does feel completely different to my left hip. So they start to go, they start to kind of recognize a bit more and understand their own bodies because that's what you want them to do. You want to really get them to know how their body is, you know, how it feels, how it's moving, where the breath is going, why is the breath, you know, so they start to have this whole inquiry. And then, you know, and then obviously I like to sort of incorporate sort of health benefits, you know, like, you know, why are we doing this movement? How could it, you know, benefit you? You know, if you've got someone with a scoliotic curve and you're doing a few movements going, this is really going to help you with your scoliotic curve, opening up this and this, they're going to go, oh, hey, I love this. This feels really good on my back. This feels really good on my spine. I've got a scoliotic curve. I want to come to this class because this is just really helping. So, you know, it's, so it's like a layer cake. You know, you're just, you're inviting, you know, you bring them into the movement and you've got the sensory language and you're bringing in that inquiry. So they're, so it's not them, they're just going to a class, I'm receiving this, you know, and then I'm going to go home again and get on with my life. You're going, actually, that, that class kind of got me thinking a little bit more about, you know, my body and how my mind is and my breath. And so they start to have a bit more curiosity. And then they go, actually, I think I'm going to go back there because that was kind of interesting. I think I want to like learn a bit more. Um, so you're educating, you know, you're, you, I think it's really important to, to ed, you know, to educate your students um, and not just be like, okay, here we are doing this practice. I mean, like, for example, I always find it really interesting planning classes, okay? So planning classes, you know, I'm really into like sequencing and I and I think it's all really great. Mm -hmm. but sometimes it's just great to just let it all go out the window as well. And I think, you know, a really, you know, a good teacher is someone who can really sense the energy of the room, you know, sense the energy of the room, what's going on. Like I work incredibly intuitively. I work with energy. I can sense energy. There's a kind of a deep sacred kind of synergy that happens between a teacher and a student and a student and a teacher. And I can just feel that. And that for me is the beauty of being back in the studio. I love being in the studio with the students. Oh, come back everyone. I know, come back everyone. Because it's just such a unique experience that I can't even put into words. It's just so beautiful. And I think, you know, sometimes, you know, of course I'll have like a skeleton, I'll have like a foundation of, you know, what I'd like to teach or, you know, I've got a theme I'd like to work with. 
But sometimes, you know, you get you've got stuff going on. You go, actually, no, that's not really going to work tonight. So we're gonna we're gonna go off in a you know we're gonna go off piste. You know, we're gonna go off in a different different uh, direction. Fascinating. How um, I was while we were talking, then I was just thinking about so so. First of all, a couple of things were coming up for me. Um, it sounded very. I don't know if you know much about craniosacral therapy, but it sounded very like a very craniosacral approach where the practitioner listens to the to the to the to the client's body and the client's body effective and, and creates spaciousness mm. and by creating spaciousness but also being present the person's body communicates and shows the practitioner where they need to go and then unwinds they, there is even something called a myofascial unwind mm. um and in a way it's almost like such it's, it's almost like a psychotherapeutic approach where, but in silence, where the, where the person has had a safe space created, allowing them to explore particular things that, that, is, that are there present right now and to effectively unwind them, which is a very, very, very deep approach and allows for much more long, uh, long lasting results in a short space of time. Because if someone has held a it might be an, an emotional thing it might be a phys if they've held a um a deep set muscular pattern in the head of their femur bone in the in the joint there and it and it's held there for 25 years and if there's a microscopic release there um that's that's a couple of years worth of unwinding in in a few minutes so that's a powerful powerful way of doing it as opposed to the you will do this and uh which is a kind of a harder approach um I also had one question for you, which was, so you've talked about helping your students to release psychosomatically, which obviously has deep beneficial, um, deep pen of beneficial results. What about the spiritual realm or the mystical realm or the um, higher, higher realms? How do you go about accessing that in your classes or with yourself or, or bringing your own personal approach to, to that for your classes? Well, I'm, I mean, I love the spiritual realm. I'm um, that, I mean, you know, it all, it all goes hand in hand, you know, you can't work with just the physical and the mental. And of course the spiritual kind of comes through. Um, um, it's, it's incredibly profound. I think working, um, uh, there's lots of different ways I bring it in. I love chanting, you know, coming back to the back to yoga and, and, and the heart. Um, I think that's really, really centering and really, really grounding. I love bringing all the mysticism in, um, bringing in quotes and poetry, um, and, you know, the sutras and, you know, just weaving it. I think it's, you know, I mean, I, it probably comes a little bit more into retreat, but I do bring it into the classes as well. I mean, it's really beautiful, I think, to weave um, all of that within within the practice because it's so it's so embodying of what yoga is, you know, and it's so much more than just a physical exercise. And I think, you know, when sometimes people first come to yoga, they think, I want to get a bit more flexible. I want to get, you know, more strength or whatever it is, or I want to overcome, you know, some injury. And actually, when you start to bring in more of the meditative kind of practices and um, and some of this, you know, this, the, the deep bodied, you know, spiritual, you know, the texts, you know, the, the Sanskrit is, you know, it's, it's a science, you know, it's, 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 it's incredible. So there is so much, and I think working with sound, I mean, I find working with sound incredibly healing um, and, and, and bringing it into, you know, when even when you're doing movement, it doesn't have to be just when you're sitting. So um, I really, yeah, it's a complete holistic approach of bringing in mind, body and spirit for sure. Mm. What kind of, and what kind of sound would you be would you be using in your class? I mean, you know, it can be really kind of basic sounds. I mean, I've got you know different different you know chants I like to use um, some of the Vedic chants, um, and then you know you can just do. I mean, I think mantra is really really powerful anyway. I think the the vibrational energy that it creates in the body and it allows us to go into deeper states of awareness and meditation when we use it. 
So, you know, I would use like a really simple one, like so hum, you know, it's like, you know, inhale, so exhale, hum, you know, it synchronizes beautifully with the breath and it allows people to kind of get a little bit more out of their thinking mind. I mean, I think, you know, with meditation, it's, it's important to kind of relate to students. You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, I can't stop my thoughts. And I say, well, we're not trying to completely stop the thoughts. We're just trying to, you know, increase the gaps, you know, the spaces between the thoughts. So you can kind of drop into those moments of stillness. And I think it's about consistency. You know, I think it's like every day, you know, I really, I really kind of teach that to, to the students is like just showing up you know, just showing up is enough and just coming to your mat every day, even if it's just to sit, even if it's just to like, you know, lie for 15 minutes and do some floor work, you know, but just coming onto your mat every day, breathing, connecting inwards. Um, it's just so, so valuable. It's just having that consistency. I mean, I've been, I've had a meditation practice now for, I don't know, 12 years, 15 years daily. I don't, you know, it's like I get up, I brush my teeth, it's like I go and sit, you know, it's, it's, it's just a part of, you know, my day, you know, and I couldn't be without it. it, you know, it connects me inwards, it grounds me, it's just, you know, it sets you up for the day. And of course, you know, some days it's really, you know, you can have a really turbulent, active mind, you know, it's, you know, we're human beings, right? And then other days you can just really drop into that quite serene, quiet, space where you get a lot of clarity and I think it really reflects I mean for me the yoga you know your yoga practice it's um you know you want to feel empowered you know you want to feel alive you want to feel empathy you know loving kindness you know you bring loving kindness to yourself and it's not just you know my teacher's tears little out in America he I remember when I went to Santa Fe um, a few years ago and I was studying with him. And we, were work, we were working with the whole concept of metta, the, you know, the, the kindness, the loving kindness. And he said, it's not just about soaking it, you know, to like 30%. It's like really soaking that metta, like right down into the like depth of your kind of soul, you know, like 90, 100%. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And I, I really took that away from that particular training. I was like, I'm really going to soak this, mm -hmm. this love and kindness, you know, and then you, you, you've got, you give that to others, you know, when you're loving and kind to yourself, and you have that empathy. And being a teacher, you've got to be empathetic, right? I mean, you know, you can't be a yoga teacher and not be empathetic. Well, I don't think, you, you know, it's like, they go, you know, just but but it starts with the self, but not in a selfish way. It's like, you know, just be loving and kind to yourself. And then you can, and, and the practice informs what's, you know, your practice on the mat informs what's going on off the mat. You know, it's, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, I, you know, I believe this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've got to say your, your yoga classes sound very nourishing. I yeah. think probably has got something I'd hear if I was to speak to some of your students. Um, I know you're an, you're an aromatherapist as well, right? Yeah, yeah. How does, so how does that link into so, what So that links in, I mean, you know, the, I, I think from a kind of sensory realm, it integrates really nice because, you know, in fact, we are awakening the senses, you know, we're awakening the senses in our practice. So I love bringing in the oils and the smell of the oils. And, you know, when students go into Shavasana, we do like, you know, oils and this, and it, it gives them a whole different experience as they're going into Shavasana. And I use different oils for different chakras. So they're all kind of like blended, whether it be your solar plexus or your heart chakra. And, um, and then, you know, I weave that, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously I work with private clients and they'll have a yoga session and then they'll have aromatherapy afterwards. And it's a really deep, it's like a ritual, you know, it's, because it works on, you know, aromatherapy works on so many different levels, you know, but you, because you've got the, because you're working with the sense of smell, you know, you've got to, it kind of, it can bring up a lot of like nostalgia as well. You kind of go into that memory bank of. That's the oldest sense in the body, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's so I, I think it's, um, I think it just, it, it just marries really beautifully um, with yoga. And I suppose, you know, as a teacher, for me, that kind of the power of touch and that kind of hands-on experience and being a body worker and working with bodies 
and having that confidence of working with bodies and you know so you know uh you know manual assists and kind of adjusting people is just that's always just a really beautiful experience because it's not pushing someone into a pose but it's just that invitation of like maybe they could just feel something slightly different and and that's you know that is a big part of of the way i teach is you know and i think because there's an assertiveness you know when i'm working with someone's body I'm very tuned in. Like I don't actually even need to put my hands on their body. I can energetically just kind of feel um, what's what's going on for them. So yeah, I I really like the synergy of working with with both. Wow, great. I I, I mean, ar <clears throat> aromatherapy is not something I know much about. But last was it last year? My little my son contracted um, a, a skin a viral you know skin thing. And um, there was for which there's really no cure except burning the things off. Yeah. So, uh, someone told me to. I think I was in touch with you around that time as well. Because yeah. someone someone recommended to me using um, high grade essential oils to, to 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 work on it. And I and I went on a whole mission, um, gathering some some oils and then mixing this potion, um, this recipe, which we then treated him full on with for a couple of months did show did show some results but but more than that i was introduced to the oils and introduced met some aromatherapists and it did definitely uh, i did definitely find it fascinating in the end we managed to cure him with duct tape believe it or not <laughs> oh my god <laughs> um which is also a slightly random but but known method yeah i think working with oils i mean you know there's so many ways in which to you know work with oils in your life i mean you know i've got diffusers all over my house you know because they're like a mood enhancer you know you put some rose or frankincense you know and immediately just en enhances the mood you know you can have oils that you know you know whether it's in the bath you've got the massage you've got compresses i mean i went to france to do I, part of my training i trained with neil's yard and part of my training, we had to go to France for the week. And obviously over there, they, you know, it's like you're, you're like a doctor as an aromatherapist. You know, they use suppositories and, you know, I mean, it's a whole, you know, they, they ingest them. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, they, you know, they've taken it on a whole another level. Um, yeah, and you can definitely feel how different scents um, have different emotional reactions for you. 100%. Yeah, straight away. I just don't like that. Yeah, wow, that just that just, just does something for yeah. me. Um, and obviously yeah. we know with perfumes um, that they can literally, you know, just captivate people. And it's your pheromone. It's your pheromones. You know, you like, you know, like there'll be someone sent. You're like, oh my god, you smell really good. Like your pheromones are like really connecting. And then someone will be like, oh, actually no. Like, <laughs> yeah. so it's like you know, it is. It's that primary. You know, our sense is like so primary um i'm like this all the time i, I mean i can literally smell everything <laughs> have you read perfume huh have you read the famous novel perfume yes i have it's beautiful. fantastic it's beautiful. fantastic it's beautiful yeah so i think i you know I, they and, and i mean as a practitioner as an aromatherapist because i don't do masses and masses of treatments it's not like i'm treating sort of six people a day you know i just do, i do a few a week and i i really love that because i can just really you know every experience is so unique to to me and that and you know i blend up the oils individually to that person and you know i've got different tools in my box so you know i'm yes i'm an aromatherapist i was trained as an aromatherapist but you know, I do deep tissue, I do aromatic reflexology, I work energetically. I've been doing a lot of energy work that has just, just come naturally. Um, I've sort of, I'm kind of channeled through. Um, so that's been really interesting to kind of, you know, shift deep blockages in people's, people's energy fields. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really interesting work. I absolutely love it. Fantastic. When are, you, when, are, when are your classes? Tell us when you're teaching. When, if I wanted, or if a student wanted to come and. Yeah. So, at the moment, so I, I'm teaching on a Monday evening at the moment. Um, I've got a day class, but it finishes this week. But what I'm going to be offering in the autumn is I'm going to do like a trilogy of workshops because I like to kind of um, work kind of quite deeply and for a longer period of time. 
So um, I'm just putting those together at the moment. I might do like three or four workshops and I'd like to have um, another class as well. It's just been, <laughs> there's been quite a lot, of, lot going on. I've got a few yeah. other projects I'm working on at the moment, but Monday okay. evening I'm there. Okay, so that'll be, that's at Yoga Love Beethoven Street in West Yoga London. Yoga Love Beethoven Street. It's quite a full class. I get, you know, I've got full capacity every week. Um, so people do need to like book in and hopefully as we kind of go through, we'll be able to get the capacity. We'll be able to have more people in the studio, but being in the studio is an absolute joy. And I really, really recommend people come back, um, cause it's such a unique experience and it's just so lovely to be in the energy of people and togetherness. And it's, you know, it's a Sangha, you know, for me, everything right now is about community. It's about the collaboration. It's about togetherness. It's about, you know, supporting each other um, and keeping life simple. You know, simplicity is the key. But being together, being together is really, is really where it's at. Thank you. So that's Laura Stapleton at Yoga Loft in London. Thanks so much for joining us, Laura. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Simon. And um, I'll see you soon. See you soon. Namaste. Bye.